Okay, I couldn't remember. We want to ask you about the library, too, because you were very, very involved with the library. Okay. Well, okay. but you were on the gala. I was on the gala. Yeah, I did the gala, but this man All right, lives. and so we, uh, <laughs> we'll be sure that I'll try not to interrupt. And, you know, uh, again, if y'all want to compliment each other on any uh, discussion. But no arguments. Like, huh? No arguments. <laughs> oh, I don't care. We'll get that on the set. We, we have not. <laughs> I don't think we've had a husband-wife team. She, uh, she <laughs> is the star. I'm just here. Yeah, okay. Well, you, you can put it in your ticket. Okay. Okay. Uh, Don and Elaine, we're, we're glad that you could join us today to get stories of Pflugerville. It's uh, the 50th anniversary of the city being incorporated. So we want to uh, capture uh, your recollections of the town. So tell us your name and where you were born. Don Boozer, and I was born in Nacogdoches, Texas in 1942. And um, we, my family moved from Nacogdoches to a little town outside of Houston called Pasadena in 1950, 51. Elaine? I am from Clarendon, Texas, which is in the Texas Panhandle, and moved to Austin in 1976, and moved to Pflugerville in 1985 when we got married. Okay. And so what were you doing in 1985? Getting married. I mean, 65. 65. <laughs> and six, no, it's okay. In 65, uh, I was around 10, and uh, my mother was very young, so my grandparents basically raised me. So my Mom's siblings were like my big brothers and sisters, and my Uncle Don was drafted into Vietnam, so that made a big impact on me I yeah. see. at that age and missing him and sending him cookies, but learning to live with the fear, you know, of what's, where he is and what he's doing, so. Yeah, we're not that far along. Yeah. Okay. Anytime. Good afternoon, Don and Elaine. It's so good that you could be here to share stories of Pflugerville. Uh, the city is 50 years old and uh, incorporated in 1965. Tell us your name and where you were born. My name is Don Boozer and I was born in Nacogdoches, Texas. And uh, my family moved from there to Pasadena, Texas, where I went attended schools in 1952. And I'm from Clarendon, Texas, which is in the Texas Panhandle, and uh, graduated from high school and moved to Austin in 76. So what was happening in 1965 in your lives? <laughs> well, I was, that was my first year out of Baylor and uh, starting my first job and I worked for Houston Power and Light in Houston, Texas. And, and you said uh, and, and you had an uncle? I had an uncle that was like a big brother to me, just a few years older, and he was drafted and went to Vietnam. So what brought you to Pflugerville, Don? I was hired by a national company from Phoenix to come to Houston, I mean come to Austin as project manager for them on a new home division. And then coming to Pflugerville in 1985, Elaine and I got married. And the only house that I had finished and complete was in Pflugerville. So we temporarily moved here <laughs> and with Elaine's two boys and uh, temporarily has lasted an awful long time. <laughs> 30 years. And yeah. uh, this home was located? This home was located in Gatlinburg subdivision and I'll steal one from our previous city manager and mayor is that I lived next door to Chief Beesing at the time and on the other side was uh, First Sergeant Hooker, and Beesing liked to tell the story that he had sin controlled in Pflugerville. He lived between the Hookers and the Boozers. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, Elaine, tell us about uh, uh, y'all's career together or your business, uh, how, how that came to be. Um, my father was a builder and, and I didn't want that life because I grew up in it and uh, went, went to go to college and get a, a real job. And I did, uh, did go to junior college and moved to Austin to do UT and didn't get in there. But um, we, I was always in commercial construction, so I, I did that. And then uh, I went to a party at, with a friend and 
she introduced me to Don, and we were married within three months. It's been 30 years, and I called my mom and said, I'm <laughs> marrying a builder. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, then you formed your own company. Actually, I had a company already formed okay. and, and was in the building business on my own when Elaine and I got married in uh, 85. And that was really the start of the great downfall or depression in the area in home mm -hmm. building. And that's how we kind of started our remodeling business is that we would go in and finish up homes that other builders had started, had gone bankrupt. And it kind of evolved from that. We formed a team and this girl was out doing anything and everything on a house from cleaning it to painting it and whatever. And uh, you know, we, w we discovered that we worked real well together and it's been a very, very successful business for us. And over the time you have actually constructed uh, uh, office buildings here in Flickerville, We've got, I built three office buildings that we own for ourselves in Pflugerville. I built numerous office buildings for other people, but uh, in the Pflugerville area, I built those three, and then I built several homes as well, including the several two that we lived in here. Mm -hmm. Elaine, you uh, began volunteering in many uh, arenas <coughs> in the community. Tell us about some of those uh, activities that you uh, were in uh, with yeah. your children perhaps? That's where I started when we got married in 85. Um, a gentleman named Bill Cartwright lived on the left side of us and he was a fireman in Austin and he was on the Little League board and um, he graciously volunteered me to be parent rep <laughs> and so that's where I started and I remember going to the very first uh, Little League board meeting and it was held where the that little building, it's gone now. Oh, no, it's still there, right right on the corner. And I got home like 3.30 in the morning. That was the l longest board meeting I had. I mean, they just, they argued more than they, dis than they made decisions. Uh, little the Little League issues. <laughs> so you can imagine. So this was in 80, probably 86. Mm -hmm. So I started there and then we became, our sons played soccer. So we be also became involved with the so on the soccer board. And then we went to the Pflugerville, First United Methodist Church of Pflugerville. So we were involved with the church and sort of evolved then to PTOs and uh, then we got involved with the chamber and then we got involved with the chamber auction and then I was, I was hired as the downtown planning, downtown consultant for the city of Pflugerville to do the downtown beautification project, which also entailed when we first tried to start the farmer's market that didn't quite take off, that was in 95. And then from there I was, um, I uh, had a phone call from Bob Spoonmore, who was the school superintendent, and said that they had a, a board member that was resigning and that they were interviewing and they wanted me to interview to serve on the board. So I went in and met with uh, Mr. Spoonmore and, and Dr. Bur Jeff Burnett and they called me a few days later and said that the board had decided to appoint me onto the board and then I ran uh, three terms after that. And you were Served. the first, you were the first woman to be on the school board in Pflugerville at that time, so. And uh, your leadership evolved to being board president also. Right. And uh, uh, what were some of the challenges that you faced uh, at that time as a district? Growth. It was just, it was growing so Students rapidly. Yes, and it was just trying to keep ahead of the, of the uh, curve and making sure that I think to me our main focus was that our students were not going to be housed in portable buildings and so we tried to, uh, we had, I think Randy Reese was in charge of, of, of uh, pro projections at that point and he worked closely with the city of Austin and the city of Pflugerville to find out what new subdivisions and apartment buildings were coming in because they could build an apartment complex and open it in the summer and we could have a full, a, an entire elementary school. So it was just trying to stay on top of the growth to me and finances, financial aspect. Your experience um, in the city, you knew the community, which was uh, a very vital component to being a uh, successful and effective uh, board member of, of knowing the pulse beat of the community and then projecting it into the education arena. Right, I did feel, um, you know, of course, Pflugerville ISD is so large that we encompassed North Austin. So it, it was, I knew some of the families over in 
on the west side of 35, but that really was Jeff Burnett's area. And, um, but yes, I think that helped me a lot. Just, I, um, I think the people in the community felt comfortable with me and they could tell me, you know, their, their concerns. Uh, and, I, and, I, and just having children in school, I think that made a tremendous difference. Just having students and listening to parents behind me or around me at basketball games. And, and I just think that I, we were aware of what was going on in the community at that time. What was one of the more rewarding uh, uh, aspects of serving on the board? You made me cry. Uh, to give my boys their high school diploma. Okay. Walking across that Walking stage. Walking across that stage. And you knew the struggles that they had endured yes. for 12 yes. years. Yes. But they made it. But it just it was, and, and not just the boy, my boys, but all of their friends. I mean, it was just, you know, I they were together from kindergarten on. And so they were really like my kids too. So that was that was a very rewarding part. The uh, uh, board was also recognized on the state level during your service? Yes, we were on Tell our board. Tell me about how that process worked. Oh, you know, we're, we were nominated and um, of course we uh, filled out the paperwork and, and presented it and we were awarded Honor Board of the Year in 1996, I believe, 1995. Okay. And uh, it, was, it was a great honor. I, I think with me being the baby on the board, I didn't realize how uh, significant that was, but that was a great honor. And the nice thing about it is Tim Warren also went with us, so he was because he was such a part of the, he was a part of the board mm -hmm. at that time, so he yeah, attended. He, had just, gone off the he had just gone off probably six months before. Um, he left January, and I think we were presented in September. So, so this was like the board of Texas for that year, which for uh, over 1,000 districts have correct. school boards, so that was right. really uh, yeah. an accomplishment. It was a great accomplishment. Yeah. Uh, Okay, you uh, mentioned about being on the uh, chamber. Uh, yes. Tell me some of the activities and about how many members did the chamber have? Uh, I think we, we I think we had around fifty to sixty. It's a little difficult to remember back that far when we started, but uh, I was I became involved. It was uh, the Blakesleys and uh, you know uh, Scott Winton, and there were a lot of people involved. Cliff Avery, they were all involved in the chamber. And I became involved with the auction. So we always had a great, a, a huge auction every year. And that was and your fundraiser. That was my fundraiser. first, yeah, that and was our main fundraiser. The of the chamber, I did yeah. eventually serve as president. Now I think they're called chair and not president. But um, that's how I became yeah. involved, really in the community, because the, the auction was such a big deal then. It was such a, it was a social event too. And just being around, you know, the Gaddies and the Timmermans and, and uh, the Murkisons, and, and it was just, I think it was the way uh, we developed our social circle in Pflugerville. Rather, not only, not just our children's parents and friends, but we kind of developed our own little mm -hmm. circle. And what was the location of some of these chamber events? Well, the, the, the auction was always held at Winnie Mays, and the Murkisons. In the pasture. In the pasture. With the big tent. With the cow patties. And I can remember, uh, <laughs> We had a friend that owned, or he was manager of a um, billboard company, Ronnie Crouch. Reagan and Billboard. Company. Reagan Billboard, and he he did a huge banner. I mean, it was probably 50 by 100 feet by 50 feet high, and we were out there with the wind blowing in the pasture, trying to hang that on one of the barns. And <laughs> I can just remember all these all these guys out there trying to get this banner hung, and then, um, oh gosh. And my mind just went, Audrey Deering, they, they were so involved and that's how I became such dear friends with her. And they, they would, the men would be out cooking all night. They would cook the barbecue, they'd go out the night before. Mr. Deering was Mr. He? Yeah, very. He was he an, good oh, he was a wonderful man. Just mm -hmm. a an, an wonderful man. And so it was just, it was just uh, a great time for us to really become involved in the community. Uh, the library was another vital part of uh, the community and uh, it, it had a long history of getting going but the uh, the first gala to raise money for this particular building uh, were do you recall any of that yes and I, I'm trying was it was at Audrey probably that asked us to be chair I'm not even sure who actually, approached us actually I don't know if it was just Audrey or what they came to you and I because you had been school board and I had been on different committees and stuff that and kind of, you know, 
they were wanting to have a gala to raise money. And at that point, I don't think we really, anybody realized what a gala was. <laughs> and uh, so Miss Wonderful here came up with a great idea that it would be a formal and well, have tuxedos in Pflugerville. Yeah. And all and that. That was probably a first. That <laughs> was a first. That and it was first. also, oh, it'll never work, it'll never work. Anyway, I think we raised over seventy thousand dollars for I, the library, or something like that. I don't and, remember, but it was a it yeah. was the the thing that I remember about it is that it was a committee, and that's what I loved about it is mm -hmm. that we created not just us, but we all all the volunteers created committees, and mm -hmm. and each you know each division chair, each chairperson was responsible for a specific portion, and we had a silent auction and. Uh, you know, we charged a hundred dollars a couple or a ticket. I can't remember, and that was just like no one could believe that we were putting that that amount of money for a ticket. Mm -hmm. But it was it was really a group effort. I mean, it just it all came together. Yeah. Um, I remember uh, someone, my daughter, uh, knows her grandmother's friends with Liz Carpenter, and so I called Liz and said, you know, we would love for you to speak. And we asked Cactus Pryor, but he. He had previous engagement, but I can remember driving out to Liz's house and explaining to her what we were doing, that we'd love to have her come and, and speak, mm -hmm. and um, just, and we had, uh, Jake Pickle was here, and so and it was he just. he was the uh, U.S. representative. He was a U.S. Right. right, the U.S. representative, so it was just, uh, I think we were fortunate that we had, uh, we had such a, a great support from the community as far as donations, and, and not only donations for the auction, but donations of people purchasing those items there you know they and so many of them were anonymous and so we were able to get some substantial donations from that area well and i think were there bricks uh our, our names on a plaque something yeah that, we with, did with, uh, it was there, there, yeah there were several different avenues that people could donate right right, right. is that i and i guess that's on display here correct it I, was uh, I, I, I don't know that. Was, I don't think was, I've ever it seen it. Oh, okay. The original oh, the original. Okay. Yeah, I don't. Yeah. Know. I don't know that yeah. I ever. Since they added on, I don't know what. Yeah. What happened to that? Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> it's, uh, it is okay. Uh, and then uh, when they actually dedicated, at some point, Laura Bush was involved. I think that was the that was the dedication, dedication. That was right? Separate from the right. And we had asked them to be her specifically because of her involvement with the libraries and. Texas, but she couldn't speak because she had a previous engagement. Uh, Don, I wanted to talk about the soccer uh, program. Uh, soccer is a relatively new sport in the sense that football was here, baseball was here, but soccer, uh, it, it was a new thing to Pflugerville once upon a time. So yeah. that happened through parents getting involved. Can you tell us a little bit about well, soccer? Well, in 1985, I think it was really just getting on it is a couple of years old in Pflugerville and we were they were playing on a makeshift field up behind the little league uh, ball fields and I remember when we came in having played football in college my great idea of soccer was to kick the ball as far as you can and I quickly learned that that's not what soccer is all about <laughs> and the next thing we worried about is the ground was big old cracks in the ground, was afraid the kids are going to get hurt. So I was, at that time, I was having several projects under construction. So I was able to get my subcontractors and suppliers to volunteer to bring in all the field dirt and the tractor work. And we rebuilt the soccer fields into a, to the dimensions that actually fit what a real soccer program should be. And uh, then we got all of us fathers volunteered out and wives. We put in our sprinkler system to keep the grass growing. But so, until then, I would go up and move the water sprinklers every four hours. But <laughs> soccer has, you know, it has grown by leaps and bounds. It's a wonderful sport for young people to get involved in, both boys and girls, because, you know, it, it knows no boundaries. And it leads into uh, even all the other sports. If they want to play football in college, you'd be surprised how much soccer helps them to do it. So we feel like we got the start here, and then later on, Elaine was very instrumental in getting the soccer program into the high school. At that point, we didn't have a soccer program in our high school. And so 
it uh, is involved both now. I, I think that we have so many teams in Pflugerville, I hear that they're fighting for places to play, so. Yeah. So that first uh, field was over off of Emanuel there by the That's correct. elementary, by right. the Little League. And right. now, is it, do they still have a soccer field there? Is no, it baseball no, there? No, the, and we're on Spring the Hill. moved over right. to next to Spring Hill Elementary, mm -hmm. and they put in a real nice facility. Then baseball, Little League Baseball, evolved and took over that thing and built several more fields themselves for their purposes. And, and here again, the growth of Pflugerville has just been astronomical. I think when Elaine and I first moved here, the sign on the the population sign on the city limits says 465. No, I think it was I don't four, know. We're probably bumping 50,000. I think 000. it was 44, 44, and 85, right? I think it was. I, I really don't know. It, I think that's what it was, but it doesn't well, matter. Well, this, yeah. this you have to remember was at the time downtown Pflugerville. Right. And yeah. it's not, it didn't encompass all of the that's areas true. that we've now grown to. So I think, you know, when we became a charter city, it was actually the start of the growth of Pflugerville because we were able to do so much in uh, going out and bringing areas into an annexation that we didn't have the power to do before. What year did that happen about? Do you know? The Charter, Charter City thing, I believe, was about 86 or 87. I know I was on the, article. the first article Charter on Review Commission mm -hmm. and to set up the rules and stuff for the Charter. and. I don't know who the mayor was in that time period. At the mayor, that's a good question. We've had so many. Right. Uh, I believe the mayor probably was Scott Winton when it first started that. And, uh, you know, but, so that uh, enabled them to, uh, the city to go out and extend their ETJ? And that's correct. Yeah. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, self-govern, I think, was the important part. That's when we were able to really have a, our own mayor councils form of government mm -hmm. and, you know, set up the committees and the commissions. I know I served on the Planning and Zoning Commission for many years and, uh, you know, at that time it was a real battle, you know, everybody was all new and every developer came in, we had to require them to put in a hike and bike trail and they all, this was a very big contention point with the developers. but. Now we have one of the most fantastic hike and bike trail systems in any city in uh, this area. But uh, so I think that Pflugerville has been well managed in, the, in its growth and uh, stuff. And that also allowed the, the green space, right? Open space uh, that, that became the hike and bike. That right. was a requirement for the developers. Yeah. So you've seen and being in construction lot sizes uh, we were uh, visiting with some of the uh, early residents in Old Town where, you know, they had nearly a 125 foot frontage on there. <laughs> uh, and today I have no idea what it is, but I know that that's, well, that's a concern in uh, how your city develops is what the lot sizes will be and what restrictions are right. on the home. Pflugerville had always prided itself in having a minimum lot size and I believe at that point the lot size was like uh, 9,000 square foot, something like that. Anyway, it's awful big by development standards. Also, uh, the apartment density, you couldn't have no more than 10 units per acre, which made it totally impossible to build an apartment project and make the economics work. So Pflugerville had some pretty hefty rules against the development, and I think and, and the economics of affordable housing and not just affordability, not just for uh, the lower income, but affordability for everybody. I think now that, you know, that the lot sizes and stuff have been evolved back more to a standard situation. Com comparable to other uh, Correct. Mm -hmm. cities. Uh, what about mixed housing in the city? Uh, that, that's been a uh, a challenge in a sense that, um, um, in other words, Pflugerville for a while had mostly starter homes, and then you have uh, uh, some that are uh, at another level. That, does that come through planning? And no, that came through economics. I okay. think that you're right. When I first moved to Pflugerville, and I built several speculative homes, 
of which I'd lived in. But uh, I think that uh, uh, most of the development had been on in Pflugerville by the large developers. And so they're the ones that were coming out. They were coming from Austin because the land was cheaper in Pflugerville. Development costs were much easier to develop the land in Pflugerville than it was, say, west of I-35 in the hill country. So affordability from the standpoint of the starter homes did. But I think in now, after that first wave of it, in the latter years, we've now got some, you know, some pretty nice homes. We still trail the, you know, some of the more affluent areas in West Austin, B Caves, West Lake. But, you know, that's not, that's not who we are, I guess, so. <laughs> uh, Elaine, tell me about the uh, Pflugerville Flash. What is that? <laughs> that was um, all of the, the mothers of the soccer players we were together 10 years probably. And so as the boys were growing and moving into high school, we missed each other so much that we formed a, the mothers formed a soccer team and we were the Pflugerville Flash and we played in, at Zilker and um, it, was, it was a lot of fun. Had so, several school the, teachers. It was uh, kind of like powder puff. Football, it, it, was, it was. It was the real thing. Yeah, it was the we're real sorry. thing. We're still paying for that with yeah, her knees. <laughs> <laughs> we, we would go to tournaments in New Orleans, but, but uh, it was really very competitive. And we had several school teachers on there and counselors that they turned into a different, totally different person on that soccer field. That and was this uh, mostly female, right? It was all female. Okay. Right. I did play on a couple of co-ed teams, but the flash was was female. Uh, you were talking about soccer and getting that onto the, uh, the into the UIL and into Pflugerville. I understand that lacrosse is one of those uh, new oh, sports it's, that's trying to. It's really grab hot. Hold it's really hot in Austin, and yeah. and I wasn't that. I was on the board when we were getting soccer into the school district, and I, I did attend the board meeting. But I I remember the most. Um, I remember Bill Cartwright, and I don't know, uh, he was our next door neighbor, but he was very diligent and, and really worked hard to get soccer into the school district. You mentioned lacrosse, but in, you know, because of the influx of people coming in from some of our eastern or northern uh, states, where hockey, ice hockey was a tremendous sport, and where lacrosse is an intercollegiate sport in uh, a lot of the eastern or northern states. But those people are now wanting to get it introduced, just like we did originally with soccer. So I'm sure that it won't be long till we'll see the lacrosse. I don't know about ice hockey. We don't have that many facilities for <laughs> ice hockey. But uh, where did you play football? Tell us about your football experience. <laughs> I played football for Baylor, okay. and, uh, and from '60 to '64, and uh, I played football, high school football, in Pasadena. And uh, you know, really enjoyed it, and uh, have become. I'm still a good Baylor Bear. <laughs> and and the Bears are certainly showing their colors now. That's <laughs> absolutely a good time and, to be a bear. Yes. and I you know, and I was interesting to see the young, the two gentlemen leaving just as we came in, being two great Texas Aggies, and they're also two very close friends of mine. <laughs> we have some real get up and goes. <laughs> um, Tell me about, uh, you said uh, you were involved in planning with the city, at, at coordinating something. Tell me about that project, um, the name of the project and what you did. It was, uh, it, I was called the, um, I'm trying to remember the official name, but I was a downtown project uh, coordinator. And there was uh, Tru Tru uh, Truett Gilbreth, our current city manager at that time, hired me as a consultant and uh, my specific uh, duties at that point was to do the downtown beautification project which was really to uh, convert downtown into handicapped to be handicap accessible. So there was some controversy um, with, uh, this was when we planted four trees and did some planters and did sold bricks. The brick walk. The brick walk and there was quite a bit of controversy in the community. And I guess, I guess I was so innocent, truly, because I grew up in a community that we had a huge courthouse with big trees and it was red brick and, you know, I, I felt like we should have um, a little downtown square and it was really a, an entire project. It was supposed to go from Pecan Street 
all the way through with the farmer's market, a gazebo, all the planters, and then actually go all the way to the park. I don't know if you know that was in the original design. So it, we, we were able to do the very first project and then it didn't go any further after that. But uh, it, was, um, it, it was a very contentious um, division in the city. And you know, it's like I said, I didn't, I, I didn't know what I was getting into when I, when I did it. I just thought it was gonna be a, a beautification project and a great project. And part of the contention was the visionary opposed to not changing Traditional. and keeping things right. as they were. Exactly. And status quo, right. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Status and, quo. Right. And so it was, uh, I can, and there were several articles in the paper about, about the, the, the division and that how I was taking the brunt of most of it, even though it wasn't, it was a city council decision. I was just the one hired to, to, um, you know, fulfill it and build it, so. Well, and sometimes it's a timing issue because now the farmer's market has taken hold. Exactly. And uh, might be a different flavor, but uh, uh, I worked it has so a home hard. and it, right. uh, uh, You know, with the chamber, mm -hmm. that was when I was president of the chamber, and I really wanted it. I wanted us to have a farmer's market, and we, what did we have, maybe three? The first one was huge. It was just a huge kickoff, and we had probably 60 vendors, and it was wonderful, but no one showed up, and so the vendors didn't want to come back, and it just kind of fizzled out. And but I'm so happy that it's back. I mean, it's it's timing evolved. Timing is everything. It is timing is everything. So. And those visionary things have happened. Uh, you know, even I know uh, talking about Main Street, there was a talk of making pecan one way, mm -hmm. and uh, yes. another street, Main Street, being Main one street, way, the other street right. going right behind Timmermans. I actually, don't know if you were involved one of them that. was actually through Timmerman. Yes. It was actually extending down Main Street and going all the way through Timmerman, back side of Timmerman out to Pecan. Now that was another consultant? That was another consultant. And I actually have those plans somewhere. If I run across them, I'll give them to you because it was, uh, it was presented at one of the uh, city council meetings. So, but it, I remember the discussion at Timmerman Elementary yeah. uh, in the gymnasium. Well, I think, uh, and, yeah, and, and the, uh, the old stalwarts of that f famous Pflugerville tradition of undefeated seasons couldn't see them going through their beloved football pasture. <laughs> <laughs> and then there was discussion on the other end of Main Street on what to do with the gin property and mm -hmm. uh, you know connecting Main Street all the way to 685. <coughs> I don't know if that was one in the same project or if it was no, even that a was separate a different I think those were separate. Okay. Yeah. I think so yeah. there's always completely. been this uh, discussion on what's going to happen with downtown. Mm -hmm. And I think it's ongoing even today. I do too. We're famous for having meetings and planning long range things. And, you know, some of them have gone into effect. Most of them haven't. But, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they all had merit or else they wouldn't have been brought up. But it. Uh, and it, they know. certainly bring the community to, uh, together. Pardon? Yeah. <laughs> together, yes. In the sense well, of uh, you know, showing up. For every great idea, there was a reason why it wasn't work wouldn't work so uh, but you know it's you know like moving the downtown uh, city hall into another location you know mm -hmm. there was a big attempt to do that at one time and I think economics probably destroyed that and probably someday it will but uh, you know we've to maintain a downtown cluster has always been a dream and but because of the growth of our city in so many different directions now 685 now we've got 130 coming in so really you know growth is going to move where demand requires it and i think that's basically what's happened to pflugerville well and i think the uh the latest discussion again along as you mentioned 130 and 685 that the talk is now out there again as mm -hmm. to where city hall will be someday in the future mm -hmm. and uh, yeah. where the center of the city might be uh, yeah. uh, let's talk about deutschenfest were you guys ever involved with deutschenfest mm -hmm. I, I was on uh, well just through the chamber mostly and then uh, because i was next door neighbors with david Beesing, i would always help with the money count the money so that was i was always stuck in a little trailer counting money and uh, but we were always very involved we had yeah. he was involved with the Lions Club so uh, he he sold beer and you know they raised money that way but we were always there I mean I, I was the one that 
came up with the mascot, the squirrel. I don't know if you, I think he's still around, I'm not sure, but uh, I, had the, I had the mask built, I had the costume built, and then I had to find some, someone to, to be the squirrel, and we found one of our local high school drama students, and he was, he was the squirrel, and it was around for years. It was really, we were just trying to promote or have yeah. a mascot, you know, because all, all the other cities have mascots. Yeah. So. Dutchin Fest was great for, for everybody having a, an excuse to come together and sit around and visit and talk. And I think that in the early years, especially that was so because, you know, when it started out a few vendors and volunteers and whatever, and then it just began to grow because of the popularity of it to what it is today. And I think a lot of it is we didn't even know where City Park was, you know, when we first moved here because it's sort of, to me, it's almost like a little private family park, or it was at that point, and so we didn't even know where it was until Deutschenfest, and, um, you know, it was it, it was such a, I think, and you know more than I do, I, I, I understand it just started as the community, and I don't even know how old it is, I don't know when it started or 1976. What, oh, 76, yeah. okay, so we, we got involved about 10 years later. So it it and uh, it it evolved and grew over the years, but it it was always uh, it was always the parade, you know everything was always such a big part of our boys' lives growing up. So, well, and part of this is an identity, I guess, with the city uh, are things to do. And now we have the 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 Deutschen Fest was the first. I think the Chili Fest has gotten traction, right. and mm -hmm. it's. Uh, uh, local and beyond. Right. Um, the Christmas parade has gotten to be right. very big. Yeah. And, and we did, uh, my, our thing when I was on, uh, involved with the chamber were the, were the street dances. And we would uh, put fences up around downtown. Gwen Blakesley was very involved with me. Uh, it's most of the chamber boards and, and uh, we got McBride in the ride to come in. But that was also a, a contentious um, <laughs> event because People were upset that we were blocking off downtown, and um, so we did that. We probably had what, probably did that for three or four years, I would yeah, say, it, yeah. and then it sort of fizzled out. But yeah. that was another little event that we used to do to raise money, and you know. Um, so you actually worked with uh, Gladys White yes, and uh, Shirley Wirtshin. I uh, did through City Hall through when City you were Hall. getting permits. Or? I know. I when I was doing the downtown beautification project. Okay. So, uh, and I sold bricks, so uh, we sold bricks, I think, for $15 each, and uh, so uh, the families would buy, you know, for their entire family, the children, and, and so it was so much fun because Shirley and Gladys, we, were, we had all these bricks delivered, and Shirley and Gladys were outside going, no, 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 they, they are cousins, so they need to be together here, and they don't like each other, well, so, well, <laughs> you in know. Well, in the early years, you couldn't, you know, as you said, building permits, whatever. Uh, City Hall was located in that small little building there on the corner of 2nd and Pecan, and, and I don't know how they did it because they had the police in there as well as the, you know, uh, uh, Clarence Bowles, who was the city manager, and and, and Gladys, and uh, them. So, it uh, if you wanted something, you had to go through the him to get to yeah. it. They were wonderful, still are. Just still great. You people. know, it, yeah. it 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 was just yeah. wonderful working with them, and and they're they're such giving, gracious people. And okay, so some of the businesses that were in town when you first came, do you remember the uh, individual owners or what products that? Uh, three Points, we had, Three Points had Eckerd, so that was Kelly and Uli, and then when Eckerd closed down, that's when they, that was, the first that was their was first. There was a grocery store there, there too, Greece. that was the only And then one. there was a Skillers, Green. wasn't there some? Or a what? Skillers, was it? I don't know. I just yeah, remember Eckerd's. Eckerd's. I think it's. I thought it was Eckerd's, but but there there was another. Eckerd's was down by three, at three points. points, right? And right. then yeah. there was Fresh Plus or Green and Green. Was it Fresh right, Plus? The little store. grocery store yeah. that was down on the corner. And uh, Charlie's, of course, you had to have Charlie's. Um, I just. I don't. There wasn't and much. That was kind of the restaurant. That was the restaurant. Yeah. yeah. I don't think. Enchiladas on Tuesday nights mm -hmm. was that price. Yep. Yep. Well, you, you, yeah, and we're still we're still buying well, the know, enchiladas all these years. Yeah. Their son, his son. In downtown, is, we had Free Bigs, and then it became Hanovers, mm -hmm. and you know it went through a 
uh, several different owners there, but it was still a great place to go by and get coffee every morning and, and talk. And, Gaddy's, uh, Gaddy's uh, Speed, you know. Gaddy's Speed. That was with Mr. Feepick? Or, or mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. He, he had it at first. I'm, well, there's probably someone before him, but mm -hmm. that was before me, so I don't know. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, Thurman Blackburn, who, yeah. what did he have? He was a developer in, okay. uh, here in Pflugerville and just a, um, an amazing man. He he really he lived in Austin, but he was just always very involved, and he really loved Pflugerville, so he was always... Um, de he developed the property that we're, where our home is now in downtown. And uh, what else? Uh, he well, developed. It was uh, Old Town, and then it had an addition. And then what is the place where you live now? What is it called? I think what we're called Samuelson Tract. It was the no, same. We either it was something else. <laughs> but no, it, it I was, think we're still part of the, the old was, town. Was, well, that was you know, that was still the land. And then once you go across yeah. that little draw, then that's, that's Mountain Creek, Mountain Creek, or Creek Mountain, 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 Mountain Creek. Creek. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. But it is so, Walter's Meadow. Yeah, Walter's Meadow. That's what we're called. And yeah. uh, well, Thurman had I've known Thurman for many years prior to that, both on the home builders boards, both of us served on the directors and stuff, and so. And uh, Thurman is in real estate, commercial real estate, and that thing. So, you know, it was really it was good to see Thurman take an interest in this area, and uh, he was able to come in and develop several projects. And I, going back to what you said before about affordability and raising the level, the subdivisions he put in and the houses that we built after that were all of a, I guess, for lack of a better description more expensive or, you know. They were not or, the cookie cutter. They weren't right. starter homes, right. no. And he yeah. was good friends with John Fluger, and he also was, he took a great interest. He was the one that developed the, the subdivision down by Three Points that has all the teachers' names, and uh, those were all friends, his daughter's friends and teachers, and he developed really? that. Where is this? Yeah, oh. it's Sarah's, it Sarah's Creek. Creek. Sarah's yeah. Creek, each street is named Miss, Miss Diane or you know, so he let his daughter name all the streets in that subdivision. He passed away about eight years ago. Okay, but I'll he have to drive through, drive through there. But he he would come into my office because he was so involved with the community. He would come down, come and sit in my office and say, "Okay, girl, we need to talk about this school board issue or this chamber issue or whatever." And I think he used me in so many ways to to not get things done, but to get my fill and say. Why don't you go do that? You know, he was always one of those that was kind of encouraging uh, to me uh, and supportive of, of and who was I was. And he very supportive of the library. Very and supportive. He, and he lived in Pflugerville. No, he lived in Austin. He lived in Austin, but yeah. he uh, was a. Uh, and probably really if gave you, his efforts. he did. He gave so much, and yeah. uh, he. If, if you saw a picture of him, you probably would real recognize him because he was always hanging around with John and and Charlie's and different places. So. Very involved. Uh, you mentioned John Fluger, and he recently passed away. Uh, tell me about him as a character in town. I didn't know him as well as uh, I just knew him through Chamber, I, I, and I served on one of the charter review committees with him. So, but he was always very gracious and and kind to me, and and uh, we we talked a few times about how we felt that it was time for Fluggerville to have some townhomes. You know, because John um, pretty much had his say and uh, opinion throughout most of all of anything that went on in Pflugerville, and the real estate industry and and uh, the development industry as well. And uh, you know, he had several other interests other than just Pflugerville. He had a trucking, very successful trucking company that he managed out of Pflugerville. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, you know, John had given a lot and uh, did a lot for the community without trying to get too much attention. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Larry Buckley was another uh, citizen, mm -hmm. uh, our business person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when we first moved to Pflugerville, we worked out of our home for what, I don't know, three or four years, and then uh, Larry uh, was a realtor, and he got us to lease an office space, and I call it the airplane building. I'm not sure what, Dr. Russo is there. and. Uh, Larry was just a very giving, loving man, and he he was going through cancer at that point. And um, I can remember 
uh, he came into the office and there was a light bulb burned out and, and he has cancer and he's up there changing this bulb weak and everything and I was like you don't need to do that and he said but wouldn't you do that for me and I said well of course he said then be quiet that was his personality and he was very involved they were here at the chamber at the uh, library gala yeah. and he passed away a little bit after that so yeah. the little yellow house on pecan street mm -hmm. okay do you have any stories about that that was Larry and Carolyn, and uh, you know that he had his office there for a long time, and it's a cute little house and a lot of history there. And uh, the people that grew up there actually been by and visited with Carolyn, and went through the house. So they just they bought it. Um, I don't know, eighty seven maybe eighty eight, and Carolyn still has it. So and there was artwork that was done on the house, and then also right. down on the Stager store. Yes, uh, all done by. And I don't know where all of that art. That was kind of from. came from the school. No, it wasn't through the school. I think it might have been through the chamber or. Well, the, that, that, that came through whenever uh, oh, one of the chamber where, things were yeah. we decorated. And each individual business would pick a building to decorate. I know we upgrade, not decorate, but well, upgrade. update, and, update. But it was kind of a, it was a it was a contest to see who could, you know, make make their property turn out the best. And so, uh, and one of the things was painting murals and stuff on the walls and stuff like that. And and it kind of took off. And that happened for a couple of years until, you know, it uh, kind of went to law because we were putting a lot of money into somebody else's business. Yeah, and there was also some controversy over the murals too. Design. So the design. Yeah. Yes, there, were, there was some conflict. Uh, the chamber um, over the years has had some interesting slogans, mottos. Uh, do you recall some of those? Mm. Uh, like one of the more recent ones is come home to shop right and uh, the chamber I, I think that could have been the focus in your time where uh, they were decorating you know buildings yeah or, or that I, it's been so many years ago um, I, I really don't even remember what my motto our motto was at that point uh, I do know that I was one of the first presidents that um, actually had like a retreat where we because here again one of the first chamber board meetings I went to was held in City Hall and it would go on for three or four hours and they didn't even have a they didn't agenda. even have an agenda you just talked and talked and talked and but there wasn't an agenda so we, we got an agenda and then the year I was president we actually had a retreat at at, at Spring Hill and we came up with our uh, our uh, motto our, our main um, focus and actually had committee chairs assigned and came up with an ambassador program and so we really sort of moved it into a more formalized chamber so and the ambassador program is still very strong today yes and, and very critical I think yes it is and we felt that way then too so that's and that was in 90 probably 94 um, talk about the Pflugerville pharmacy that's another uh, business that's been around for a good while just um, I think Kelly, Kelly, Kelly and I know Uli Uli, were yeah. over at the Eckerd's. Eckerd's yeah, they were just whenever they shut down or decided to close out, Kelly and Yuli had built up such a rapport and with them that they decided that they would start out on their own, and that's when they uh, moved over to the location they're in now and opened up. And uh, you know, we tease them. You know, you guys need to get a bigger space. <laughs> but uh, yeah. they seem to do it very good, and they've yeah. been a great, they've been great uh, ambassadors for Pflugerville as far as stay, staying with us. Actually, I think they're now in Pflugerville uh, city limits. They weren't at the originally. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Uh, Old Prague Market uh, with Barbara and mm -hmm. W.C. Kalanick. Tell mm -hmm. us about those two individuals and about their business. Uh, I, uh, what Don was hunting, I think, or uh, somewhere fishing and with the Bridge Farmer Boys or someone, I don't remember who, but uh, I went to the one of the auctions uh, with Skip and Georgia Duncan, who are friends of ours, and there was this woman there by herself too, and her name was Barb Kalanick, and we just connected, and, and we have been, she called me this week, and Lainey, what are you doing? You know, she's just such, she's just been a really good friend, and, and I think the Colonics were such an important part of downtown. That's where they had their insurance 
company, and then she started, that's where she started OPROG, and uh, they were just a very important part of the downtown community. Okay, uh, changes in downtown Pflugerville. Do you remember when the traffic light came or when the Shell station came? I remember both, but I, 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 one of the most important things to me is the, remember Pecan used to curve into 685. Yes. We lived in Gatlinburg, so you had to sit at that curve and wait for people to pass so you could cross over, and I had sons learning to drive, and so I was, I hated that intersection, I hated it, and I had been known to, I heard an, I'd hear an ambulance or a siren, I would get my car and drive down there if my boys were not home because that was such a dangerous intersection. And so to me, that was one of the, uh, the uh, most important traffic changes is when they continued to SL through to 685. But then being on the school board all those years, a traffic light at Bligerville High School. I mean, how many years did we try to get a high school, a light at the high school? So that was a big accomplishment, I feel. Even though it wasn't the city's responsibility to get the light there, but. So that's a, a big change. And then downtown, you know, we, we felt, we invested so much into Pflugerville and that's why we built the office buildings. We felt that um, if we were gonna live here, we wanted to invest here. And that's, that's you know, we, we became, uh, we built the three buildings in rock, with rock, which is another, you know, Dr. Uh, Hassel had already built his rock building. So there was discussion at one point that everything should be red brick two-story all the way down and so uh, but then but then you had the empty lot where the, everything burned and then you had the gazebo and then you had that little building and then you had Princess Craft and so it was really difficult to try to uh, reinforce or enforce that uh, the red brick because uh, it, it was already pretty much developed so we we built the the white rock buildings and and uh, committed to staying and living in downtown Pflugerville so you mentioned the Shell Station, and I saw a little smile on your face because that created one of the biggest controversies in Pflugerville at the time as to the architectural style of the Shell Station. And as Elaine alluded to, we've had people, everybody has their opinion of what Pflugerville should be, but how can you make this match this when there's no continuity to start with? It'd have been great if the old buildings hadn't have burned down. Then we could have followed through, mm -hmm. and then made across the, the street where City Hall is now located. We'd have made it look like that too. But the Shell Station created such a controversy in this community that yeah. they they built it without following the standards. And do you remember when the present City Hall was built? It, it was an office building before it became City Hall. It was office. Do, do you remember that? I don't. It no. was already built when we moved here. Okay. Now it was vacant for a long time. I think because that was during one of the uh, down uh, recession times. Exactly, right. and then I think there, there were several people, several different businesses had offices in it. Doctor Boyd was in that building, you know, and that's when the city bought that property and moved over from where they were located in the little house. And then it grew so fast. We actually, our company did several remodels on the uh, property for the city and uh, re remodeled the interior where uh, the secretaries are now. And the original city council met in that first little building and now it's grown so much that they built the building back behind. So. Uh, but uh, at that time, the 85s, 86, 87s were a very tough time, not only in Pflugerville, but all over this part because people were losing their homes and they were losing their businesses and then... RTC was coming in. Right. And it, it, so survival, I think, was the key thing, the key note. I, and that's what I kind of alluded to earlier when Elaine and I got married. We couldn't mm. have gotten married at the worst possible time. <laughs> that was <laughs> because horrible. Because instead of building a bunch of houses, I was now remodeling a bunch of houses. Um, that brings an interesting concept that I never have thought about uh, because uh, when, the, when the ESD built the new fire station, mm -hmm. they certainly stayed with that uh, mm -hmm. red brick. And I'm glad. And they then did. when I think about Round Rock, uh, you know, when Round Rock was exploding, particularly in the downtown area, mm -hmm. they pretty much stayed with limestone 
uh, but right. then as the city got bigger, I'm talking about Round Rock right. and even Flickerville, you know, I, I don't know what, you know, the, the overall impact other than when you're trying to maintain a downtown identity, yeah. I think. Right, and, and it would have been great if, you know, I, I've only seen pictures, of course, because it burned in, what, 74, maybe? 73, 76, 76. okay. Somewhere around that. Okay, and then, uh, so, I, you know, I have seen pictures, and it would, and, it, and it's just, it was just such a tragic, to me, it was so, such a tragedy that it happened and destroyed almost that entire block. On, well, it did half the block on that side, right, correct? Right. You were living and, here then, weren't you? Or? Okay. Uh, we weren't living in the in the city. Okay. No, we were in Austin at Austin, the time. Yeah. So. But and and you know it was just it would I think that if that hadn't happened, that it would have been easier to have carried that on, mm -hmm. you know. But I'm not sure when Prince's Craft came in and what was there before it was built. Whether it was a you know where did the residential area start and where did businesses end? Uh, and, and talking about fire, I also remember when um, Emmanuel burned. I don't know if you remember that fire. That was a very tragic, uh, yeah. scary thing. Do you remember that? I mean, I was, we lived there, and so I, I heard all this, the sirens, and I walk outside, and all I could see was this red inferno at the church. Yeah. And um, they were able to, it wasn't the church, I think it was the parsonage, or not the parsonage, but the activity center that burned. But right. it could have been very, very de uh, devastating to this community to have lost that church. Um, another business person was uh, the Gaddy Feed Store. Mm -hmm. Did you know the Gaddies? Yes, okay. Lynn. And, yes, yes, very well. I'm a gardener, mm -hmm. so, and um, both of our houses, you know, I was down there all the time buying we, we plants. We still do business with the Gaddies, yeah. and uh, it's, you know, it. They were a business that if you needed something, that's where you went to. And, uh, Frank knew this. everything. He still does. <laughs> we needed to catch an armadillo. He knew just how to catch. Him. <laughs> you just call him and he finds it. <laughs> he him. does. I mean, he always has. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Well, uh, so we're going to uh, kind of close down. If there's any other stories that you think of people that uh, that you'd like to share, this is an open open time to to say. I, I you know, I, I just feel in the community. Um, one of the ones that meant so much is you to me. You know, I, I, in being in the community, I had not met you before. I'd met you, but not spent time with you. And being serving on you with you on the school board was just amazing because I felt like uh, I feel like you're such a, a gracious, giving person to this community, and just what you do for the community is amazing. And I loved serving with Don Weiss. He's a he's a uh, true gentleman and such a good man and he always um, he's real quiet but when he really feels something and he he speaks I always listened because he had such wisdom and he knew the community so uh, that that meant a lot to me did you know mr. Timmerman at all I did T boy would come in we, I call him T boy but he would come in too into the into my office and sit down and just talk about school board things you know he he really stayed um, stayed in touch with me and I think that's why I felt so fortunate being on the board and being a woman not really knowing how some of the old timers mm -hmm. would feel about me being on the board but I, I, I'm there might have been one or two that you know I might have felt some discomfort with but for the most part everyone in the community was so supportive and really cared mm -hmm. I think they really cared it wasn't about me necessarily. They cared about the community and they cared about the school district and they cared about what was going on. And so they really uh, would just come in and, you know, if they had heard something or if they just wanted to, you know, kind of go over what was going on in the community, they would just, they would you, keep in touch with me. Yeah, you could always tell what the T boy wanted something because he'd bring you a big bushel of sweet corn. <laughs> <laughs> yes, he would. And what was his attire when he came in your office? Just his, his overalls, you know. The, same thing the as same he always thing. wore. He just came out of the field? Oh, yeah. Or out of the yeah. lot? Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's he did everything. And that came in to talk. You and know. he was very comfortable, and he, he was, came in and said what he had to say. And yep, it was great. And, you know, mm -hmm. I served with Tim Timmerman on, on chamber board, so we, throughout the years, we were really close. And uh, just, you know, he, he genuinely cared about his dad, too, as you know, of course. But uh, he, T Boy was just a, he, he was just so um, 
down to earth and honest. You know, he just he would just and tough and as just nails. Say whatever he needed exactly, to say. exactly. And tough as nails. Yes. Who was that? And, and tough. tough as nails. Oh, tough as nails. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, one of the things also uh, on the school board was acquiring land and getting school sites and. Uh, I know that you probably relied somewhat on Mr. Spoonmore. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Tremendously. Yeah, he really, uh, I felt like he did a tremendous job really uh, researching, looking where the growth was going to be, working, you know, at that point, like I said, Randy Reese was doing projections and growth and we knew it was going to be heading east and we always try to be proactive and think mm -hmm. years in advance, where are we going to need a school? and. We did, uh, I think the only parcel that I remember that we bought that uh, we never really did anything with was the corner of Palmer and uh, Cameron area. And it's still, I don't, I think it's still there. I think they have. A, a they just put a uh, McDonald's. Yeah. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. I haven't been over there in a while. Down the road. Uh, with, uh, yeah. Apartments. But I think yeah. part of the issue with that property, you know, they had some restriction that you couldn't. Uh, Access. Right, yeah. right. But now they are. Yeah, so I know. I, I think that's the reason. And Something changed with the city of Austin, I assume. Yeah, and then and then we were we actually I think had a contract to sell it to H E B, and then that fell through, and so. But from what I remember, every parcel that we bought was, uh, you know, it was well planned and and uh, built on eventually. So, and I remember, uh, and you probably do too. Uh, the big deal when my son Travis was in fourth grade is that that's when uh, sort of the, the slump was still going and we didn't grow as much and so they com they put all the fifth graders at Windermere, we'd built Windermere, I wasn't on the board then, but Windermere Elementary was built and they brought in the, the uh, fifth graders from Pflugerville Elementary and the uh, fifth graders from Westview and put them together mm -hmm. and that was just a big deal back then to combine you know, the fifth graders, and, and then they had to separate in middle school. They went back to their respective middle schools and then came back together in high school. So it, it was. So were you on the board when Conley High School was built? I was, I got on the board uh, just before the dedication. So that was my first dedication, dedication was at, with the Conley at Conley. And Nelly and the children. Yes, we were, I was there. So that was my first dedication and many more after that. Uh, I, I don't even remember how many we had. Uh, I was on the board. I was president when we were doing uh, the new high school, Hendrickson, and um, then in between that, I, I you know, it's th several elementaries. I tease Elaine quite a bit, Bernadine. I can I can foresee in the future a elementary school named after you as Mott, but I can't ever visualize one being named after Elaine <laughs> Boozer Elementary. <laughs> Probably not, but well, but he was on the committee. He was the chair of the committee that built the um, Justice, Justice Center. Center, and they actually do have a courtyard in the middle of the Justice Center that's Boozer Courtyard. So Because okay. <laughs> I objected to it. <laughs> So you helped build the Justice Center. Pardon? You built the ju or were on the. Uh, I didn't the build chair. it. I was the Citizens Committee. They appointed a Citizens Committee to head up the deal, and we worked with the architects, mm -hmm. the development, working with the uh, the police chief, city manager, everything, and proving the plans and everything for the Justice Center. Who who was the city manager at that time? Uh, I wish you hadn't asked me that. It wasn't true. It. He'd already left. It, okay. No, it wasn't true. It, it, it was uh, Steve Jones, Steve, I believe. Steve, yeah. Steve was the city well, manager. Well, I, I commend whoever named it. I, I like Justice Center as the name mm -hmm. rather than. I don't. Real I Police don't remember Department. how yeah. we came up with that, but it was. You know, it Very was. Nice. It came out of the meeting. Of, you know what to name it and. The, and as I look around, I, I have to think that that is one of the uh, highest points in the city because it's even higher than Walmart. elevation wise mm -hmm. it is elevation -wise, yeah. mm -hmm. yes, it's it a, is a prominent well mm -hmm. maybe a manual because you're going over I, I'm not yeah. sure about that but uh, well, it's it, hard to I get think a, the Justice Center yeah. is pretty it's hard to get a topography map of Pflugerville because it's so flat but you know, mm -hmm. but uh, that was a great location for the Justice Center 
Well, thank you so much thank both you. for your service uh, in so many arenas that have made a difference in our community, our city, and our schools. And uh, I know the foundation is very strong as we travel beyond 55,000 mm. uh, uh, into the future and in our school district where we're now at uh, 24,000 students. So.